Thanks for joining us for Face the State. I'm Doug Petcash. We'll get to the governor's focus in this year's State of the State address and response to it in just a minute. But first, news this week of the tragic fallout of the House Bill 6 first energy scandal. One of the key figures in the state's largest bribery scandal has died in a suspected suicide. Sam Randazzo, the former chairman of the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, was found dead Tuesday morning inside this building off East Mound Street in Columbus. In November of 2020, Randazzo's home was raided by the FBI for taking millions in bribes from First Energy. He ended up resigning. Then, in December of 2023, Randazzo was indicted on 11 federal charges related to bribery and embezzlement. In February, he was indicted by a Summit County grand jury on 27 state charges. He had not yet gone to trial in either of those cases. Randazzo, along with former First Energy executives Chuck Jones and Michael Dowling, were all indicted recently in the House Bill 6 scandal. They all pleaded not guilty. And former House Speaker Larry Householder was charged last month on state charges, but he's already been convicted and is serving 20 years in prison on federal charges. Former Ohio GOP Chairman Matt Borges was also convicted and sentenced to 60 months in prison. Two other men took guilty pleas in 2020, but have not yet been sentenced. This is the second person involved in the House Bill 6 bribery scandal that has died by suicide. Neil Clark, a prominent lobbyist who was charged in the case, was found dead in Florida. He was charged with federal racketeering for accepting bribes. Now, if you or someone you know is having suicidal thoughts, call or text 988, the Suicide and Crisis Hotline. Someone is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to take your call. Turning back now to the State House, where Ohio Governor Mike DeWine delivered his annual State of the State address on Wednesday. It's his opportunity to talk about his accomplishments and to lay out his proposals for the coming months. He started by saying he wanted to talk about Ohio's future, which is Ohio's children. Then, over the one hour and three minute speech, he announced a few initiatives on child safety and health and how to help them succeed. Democrats liked some of what he said, but wanted more. Kids have only one chance to grow up, so we must have a great sense of urgency as every moment we waste is a moment that they lose. That being said, Governor Mike DeWine then announced a new child care choice voucher program to give financial support for families of 8,000 more children to be able to access child care. Families earning up to 200% of the federal poverty level could qualify. Doing so, we will build today's workforce by getting people back to work, and we will ensure that tomorrow's workforce is prepared for the demands that lie ahead. Democrats hoped he would do more to help even more Ohio families. But we need to be able to raise the eligibility for folks who can access some assistance with child care to make it affordable. Republican Speaker of the House Jason Stevens said it comes down to funding. This is the, the challenge when it comes to budgeting and the numbers as far as increasing the numbers and, and trying to do that is what is that cost going to be. The governor also proposed expanding the state's mobile response stabilization service to help children in a mental health crisis. He proposed an initiative to ensure every child who needs glasses gets them, and he called on the legislature to ban flavored tobacco products statewide and ban intoxicating hemp known as Delta-8. Because of a loophole in the law, Delta-8 can be sold as hemp without the warning labels and age restrictions associated with marijuana. But Democrats say but he came up short on one major threat to Ohio's children. Is that the number one killer of children in this state and in this country is guns. And the governor spent less than one minute on gun violence. The governor wrapped up where he began, calling for action to help Ohio kids thrive. This is our time. Our time to chart Ohio's path forward as we protect our most precious resource, our children. Joining me now to discuss the State of the State Address is Ohio Senate Majority Floor Leader Rob McCauley of Napoleon. Senator, thanks for being here today. Happy to be here. Thanks, Doug. 
First of all, what's your primary takeaway from the governor's address? Well, the, the governor has always been somebody who's viewed uh, children as a high priority of his. In fact, it might be the primary lens through which he governs. Um, he's been somebody who's been fond of talking about his own grandfather planting trees and uh, knowing that he may not be able to see those trees come to maturity in his life, but realizing he was making an investment in the future by doing so. And that's really primarily what the state of the state address I felt was, was a progress report on many of the early investments and many of the early policy changes that the governor made um, and that were funded by the legislature. Not a lot of legislative asks in there compared to previous state of the state addresses, uh, but nevertheless talked an awful lot about the science of reading, talked an awful lot about some other programs that have been funded. So um, really more of a progress report than, than an ask uh, is what I took from it. Do you support his plan to help more families afford child care through the Child Care Choice Voucher Program for Ohio families that earn up to 200 percent of the federal poverty level? Well, it, it, I know the, the comments of the speaker were aired before uh, I came on, and I think that's really what it comes down to, is it's really easy to say, this is a good program, we should, we should want to do it. Uh, but really, it comes down to how well we can afford it. Um, in light of all the other investment uh, priorities we have in the budget, in light of all the mandatory spending that we have in other portions of the budget. And so outside the context of an actual uh, budget conversation, it's hard to say whether we would be able to get something like that done or not. Now, he did call on the legislature to ban vapes and flavored tobacco products statewide with a uniform state law. What's your position on that? I would be against that. And, and this is something where I respectfully disagree with the governor. Uh, the legislature has already acted uh, to overturn the governor's veto uh, as it concerned the, the local regulation of flavored tobacco and the bans of those as, uh, as recently as this past calendar year. Um, as well, I, I think when you look at what Ohioans want uh, in the passage of issue two, they want uh, the ability to access products that uh, are a little bit more specialized, a little bit more unique, sometimes products that haven't traditionally been available in the state of Ohio. And banning flavored tobacco products, I think, would be against what they would more than likely want to see happen in the state of Ohio. Now, as you mentioned, too, is that he focused a lot on you know, safety and well-being of children. And one of those things that he's been talking about, he had a round table on it, was about cell phone use, smartphone use in our schools. Do you think the state should get involved with restricting smartphone use by students while in school? I think it's something that's very worthy of a conversation. To be honest with you, um, you know, there are many of us who, who grew up without smartphones. There are many of us who didn't have smartphones until we were grown adults. And so we're now just beginning to see the effects it having on kids who maybe grew up with them in their adolescence, in their youth. And I believe uh, the results are kind of troubling. The results are very concerning. Uh, the mental health impact and the addictive uh, nature of smartphones that it has on many kids through the most developmental uh, years of their lives. And so uh, the research is becoming more and more clear. And as a result, we need to take a look at that and decide if it is worthwhile for us to say, no, while you are in the four walls of your school building, you need to be focusing on learning. You need to be focusing um, on your educational experience not on cell phone usage. So you think that the state should play a role and not leave that up as you know, is often talked about with local control, district to district? Well, the details are, are really what's going to matter. I know there are some districts who will tell you uh, they realize that the phones are pretty prevalent within the four walls of their buildings. And so they're trying to use those phones uh, in the instructional process. They're trying to encourage students to use those phones uh, throughout the day in so far as their lesson plans are concerned. And so there, there's a way to, in some cases to parlay it into uh, the actual teaching experience. Uh, but in, in many other instances, these phones are nothing more than a distraction and it's causing uh, many other negative impacts on our youth that uh, we really at least should have the conversation. The details of something like this will be very important. Uh, but we really should have this type of conversation. Now, not in the state of the state, but something that came out of the House this week, the bill that would mandate that students could use only the bathroom that matches their sex assigned at birth just passed out of a House committee. If it makes, to the, makes it to the Senate, do you support it or oppose it? I would support this type of legislation. To be honest with you, 
Um, the, the lens I look at is that it's not as much about the individual who wants to use the opposite bathroom uh, from, their, from their sex assigned at birth, uh, but more so the people who are already in that bathroom who are using it, who are counting on us to make sure that they're comfortable using that bathroom. That's the lens I look at this. And it's all the primarily in, in this case, it's going to be the young girls who are in our school systems who are going to expect um, that we keep people out who may be making them uncomfortable, who may uh, be uh, in some cases uh, posing a, some, some uh, risks to them in their own uh, individual daily lives and experience. And I think that's the lens we need to look at this through. Um, Senator, you represent Logan County and uh, the Indian Lake area. You know, of course, that was devastated by a tornado a few weeks ago. Uh, do you anticipate a plan soon from the state to provide some financial help for the people affected by those destructive tornadoes? I do. So the controlling board, the governor, through his own appropriation authority, um, or not really appropriation authority, but being able to move money around within line items, um, has requested the controlling board release some emergency funding for Indian Lake already. There have been conversations. I know I can speak personally. I spoke with the governor. I know he's spoken with the president of the Senate as well. Um, and I believe he's had conversations with the House as well about trying to figure out what the dollar amount is, what, what dollar amount we might be able to uh, appropriate to help those people out, particularly those who lost everything. Uh, you were up there, Doug. Mm -hmm. um, those people who didn't have insurance, um, those people who uh, y you know, maybe lived in a mobile home um, that is now completely totaled, completely lost, um, and uh, really have no place to go. And so some temporary relief is, is I think, the near-term uh, conversation we're going to have. But even beyond that, in the, uh, in the also the near-term, is what kind of relief we can offer for people who really have lost next to everything uh, in, in their lives as far as their possessions are concerned. Yeah, and I understand the governor um, had said something like maybe the, the there's going to be a meeting next week to kind of really uh, tie this up, but he had mentioned the possibility of grants, you know, get cash to help people get restarted. What do you think of that kind of that, uh, you know, immediate infusion into their pockets? Well, it, it, the details will matter. I'm, we haven't gotten too deep into into some of those uh, details. I do know this Indian Lake in particular has been uh, has had a few bad, uh, bad years of luck. I mean, they had some some weed problems in their lake. Um, that have really caused a dip in the tourism industry, which is where those businesses and, and those individuals really make their money. Um, and then this came through, which is, which is also concerning. So we've assured to the people at Indian Lake, we need to do what we can to make sure the cleanup efforts are taken care of and to make sure that the lake can return uh, to normal as soon as possible. People, in, especially in the Columbus area, who I know go to Indian Lake need to realize uh, the lake is, is still gonna be boatable. Um, there are still a number of businesses that, that are going to be able to be open and, and that are open. Um, there are still a number of uh, lodging options that uh, through, through short-term rentals that I'm sure, it's, sure are still going to be available. Um, it's going to be different, but the tourism season um, is still going to be able to happen at Indian Lake this summer, albeit um, a little bit different than years before. Senator Rob McCauley of Napoleon, thank you so much for your time this morning and for being on Face the State. Thanks, Doug. I appreciate it. All right. Well, when we come back on Face the State, we'll go across the aisle for House Minority Leader Allison Russo's takeaways from the governor's State of the State address, what the Democratic caucuses like and don't like about it. Welcome back to Face the State. I'm Doug Petcash. Today we're focusing on the governor's proposals for children in his State of the State address and response to those proposals from Republicans and Democrats. Joining me now is House Minority Leader Allison Russo of Upper Arlington. Leader Russo, thanks for being here today. Thanks, Doug. Always glad to be here. I appreciate it. Um, as I asked Senator McCauley, first of all, just what is your primary takeaway from the governor's address? Well, I think certainly I appreciated the governor centering his state of the state on children. I think there are a lot of areas for agreement um, and always have been, frankly, uh, with Governor DeWine. Uh, but I think also um, not acknowledging the reality 
realities of the current political landscape in the state house, which has been mired by extremism, uh, corruption scandals, and really dysfunction uh, that keeps us from moving forward on these issues that are important to our families, to our children, to our communities, and instead focused on real culture war issues that aren't addressing the needs of everyday Ohioans. Um, you and uh, Leader Antonio in the Senate um, talked the other day about the importance of child care eligibility mm -hmm. um, for subsidies to help more families. The governor did uh, talk about the child court child care choice voucher program for Ohio families that earn up to 200% of the poverty level. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, first of all, I'm a huge proponent of more state investment in child care because I think it's a critical uh, need for not only our families, but also key to uh, uh, meeting some of our workforce needs. Um, uh, and getting our economy back on track. Uh, I, you know, I certainly support more state investment um, into the child care sector, but the reality is the reason that we have money uh, for the governor to be able to put that on the table is because we have underspent chronically uh, from the federal dollars that we have available to address this issue. Um, and we're getting direct grants from the Biden administration uh, to address this issue that frankly have taken too long to get out the door. So essentially, we're doing catch up with this program uh, because of our mismanagement and the state government's mismanagement uh, on this issue. And you'd like to see the eligibility standards loosen. Absolutely. Right? We are ranked at the bottom uh, for eligibility for child care vouchers uh, for so, some of our lower income families. Um, and we used to be at the top of investment in this space. So we absolutely need to expand that eligibility, but we also have to be investing dollars into building capacity in more facilities, uh, paying our providers a living wage. Um, and so there are a number of things that need to be done. Uh, this will help, but the reason that we have this money in the first place is because it was mismanaged and underspent to begin with. He called on the legislature to ban vapes and flavored tobacco mm -hmm. products. Do you uh, support or oppose that idea? So I uh, have been consistently supportive of those bans. Uh, um, did not support overruling the governor's veto uh, of some of the budget language uh, related to this. I mean, the reality is a smokeless uh, flavor tobacco um, is uh, a leading risk factor for death and morbidity in this state. Um, and, you know, I, I think that it is a good public health policy. Also, um, in, in his part of the st state of the state address, um, or not, not in the state of the state address, but there's that bill that came out that would mandate that students could only use the bathroom mm -hmm. that matches uh, their sex assigned at birth. It's just got out of House committee. Where do you stand on that? I know that the, 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 the Democratic caucuses have been strongly opposed to legislation yeah, so, like this. So we are opposed. And listen, Doug, I mean, this is one more example of we aren't addressing, you know, the, the property taxes that seniors are facing that they're worried about not being able to be in their homes. We're not addressing things like food insecurity in our uh, communities. We're not addressing gun violence in our communities when our police chiefs and our mayors are asking us to deal with this issue. Uh, you know, I could go on and on. Why are we focused on this ban, which by the way also includes telling adults which bathrooms that they need to use instead of addressing the real needs of everyday Ohioans. And this is just one more example of the culture wars that distract us from doing the work of the people. Um, do you think that the state should get involved um, with restricting smartphone use in our school classrooms? Well, I, listen, uh, it was an interesting proposal by the governor. I certainly, as a parent myself, uh, have concerns uh, in this area, but I also believe very strongly that this is where our schools, our school boards are best equipped to navigate policies that reflect both what parents want in those communities and what the needs are of students and school buildings. Um, I'm very hesitant at this point to do a one size fits all from the state legislature, but certainly open to the conversation I think it's a good conversation to have, but I also want to be able to make sure that our communities and our parents and our communities are able to make those decisions. Overall, then, you, you support the local control aspect of I that. I do absolutely support local control. Um, I know that you do not represent the parts of um, Ohio that were hit by tornadoes, but in leadership, um, have, you, have you been part of the discussion or do you know the status of uh, where that is to help the people of areas like Indian Lake that were so devastated in terms of getting them state 
financial aid as quickly as possible? Yeah, so uh, certainly, you know, we do want to get money out the door uh, to those communities as quickly as possible. Uh, we do have money available uh, through a couple of different uh, funds that we can address this, certainly through the legislature. You know, the question is, is the legislature uh, and the, the supermajority uh, that's in control of the legislature, are they going to set aside the dysfunction um, in the uh, partisan infighting um, and put people first and uh, get this money out the door to uh, those communities as well as many other communities. You know, we've got uh, lots of projects, capital projects, transformational projects that we've got money right now uh, ready to go out the door and um, the dysfunction in the legislature is holding that up and, and those communities that have been hit by the tornadoes, that's just one more example of that. Yeah, and Senator McCauley and, and as well as the governor has said about urgency mm -hmm. and I, I believe um, President Huffman also represents part of that area too and it's just about you know getting it out so people can get back on their feet. That's right and it's important and, and you know the people on the ground uh, they they don't care about the infighting that's happening mm -hmm. Uh, within the supermajority, uh, they need relief now, and so um, we should treat it with that urgency in the legislature. Um, I want to ask too, just about the future. The governor laid out his priorities mm -hmm. um, and you know some vision for the next, you know, going ahead in the general assembly for the Democratic caucuses in the House and Senate. Is there a top priority um, in the coming months? Well, there are a lot of priorities because there's a lot of work that hasn't um, been done. And I think first and foremost, you know, we're hearing from our residents about the burden of property taxes. Um, and that is something that we need to address. We're going to continue to uh, put people first. Um, uh, before the politics, we as Democrats, and you know, remain as laser focused on those issues that we know uh, are meaningful to our residents and to our citizens. Um, uh, put our focus on that as much as possible. Leader Russo, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you're always welcome here at thank Face you. the State. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Doug. Well, still ahead on Face the State, the state of Ohio has not executed a death row inmate since 2018. A new bill aims to change that. Ohio lawmakers are considering using nitrogen gas as an alternative way to execute prisoners on death row. House Bill 392 would require nitrogen hypoxia for executions if lethal injection drugs are not available. The bill had its first hearing last week. Ohio hasn't executed anyone since 2018. In 2020, Governor Mike DeWine said lethal injection was no longer an option after a federal judge says it could cause inmates severe pain and needless suffering. 119 Ohio inmates currently sit on death row. A report released last week found out of the 341 death sentences handed down since 1981, only 56 sentences have been carried out. The bill's sponsors say nitrogen hypoxia is a necessary alternative method. But we're trying to address the, the, you know, the situation as we find it, which is uh, we are not carrying out the law. We are not doing what we you know, raised our hand and said we would do. Now, if we're going to use gas, which frankly our veterinarians will not use on our animals, why would we use that on human beings? Nitrogen hypoxia was first used as a method of execution in Alabama this January. According to a 2021 capital crimes report from the attorney general's office, the average time an inmate spends on death row in Ohio is more than 20 years. Governor DeWine recently said he doesn't see an appetite in the General Assembly to change the method of execution. Again, no one has been put to death in Ohio since he took office. That's all of our time for today. Thank you for joining me this week for Face the State. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you next Sunday back here at 1130.